Astronomy Cast, episode 258 from Monday, March 26, 2012. Viking Landers. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So I uh, apologize to everyone for the big delay between this episode and the previous episodes, but we are back dating because uh, I was uh, I was away in a on a European uh, European trip with my family. So uh, we had hoped to record a bunch of episodes in advance and ran out of time and and so uh, and so that had to wait. But we're going to catch up really quickly and get back into a regular schedule uh, as soon as possible. So look forward to more Astronomy Cast goodness shortly. Um, any other news on your path? You got um, a million crater challenge going on. Right? <laughs> we have a million crater challenge going on. Uh, Fraser and I, as you may have heard, are part of a new project called CosmoQuest at CosmoQuest.org. And this is a research facility for the public. And one of the science projects that we're encouraging you to help us with is a exploration of the moon where we're trying to figure out what is the most effective way to map the moon, pitting your skills against those of computer algorithms. And we're challenging you during the waxing period of the moon for this Global Astronomy Month in April to uh, mark one million craters. So we launched it on Saturday. We're up over 50,000 craters already, but we've got a long way to go by, by that May 5th uh, full moon. So, so join in, register for the site. If you don't register, your craters don't count, and um, there, there's prizes for people who hit the 100,000, 200,000, 300, and so on mark, and then 10 random people will also get prizes, and prizes range from surly Amy pendants to, to posters to uh, lunar lithographs, so get involved, help us accomplish science, and maybe get a warm fuzzy. When my researchers do good, good work for me, I feed them donuts. Shipping donuts doesn't work so well. We'll ship you lithographs instead. Right. But the key is uh, for science. It's all for science. Yeah. Uh, this is real science. This is not just some fake make work project. You will be doing actual science to identify no. creators. We, we've already published our first initial results. So it's, it's a matter of let's just keep going. Let's discover as much as we can. All right, so last week we talked about the orbiter portion of the Viking missions, but that was only half the adventure. Each Viking spacecraft carried a lander as well, which touched down on the surface of Mars, searching for evidence of past and current life. And what they discovered then is still up for debate now. Uh, and what's really great about this episode, I think, is that there's been a lot of recent controversy. Well, there's already been lots of controversy, but now there's been even more recent controversy about the Viking missions, about whether or not they discovered life. So, so this one is really, truly is ripped from the headlines. It's, it's actually kind of a good thing that you went on vacation when you did, because if you I know. hadn't, our, our entire podcast would have been entirely different, and, and that would have just been embarrassing. I know, and then right after, there would have been some really interesting stories. So, so let's, before we kind of explain everything, why don't we go back then and, uh, and talk about it. So, so what was the, um, you know, last, last week we talked about how the Viking missions had this orbiter portion that circled around and made some amazing discoveries and contributions about identifying landforms that looked something like, like, like water was active in the past. But the coolest part really was these, these landers that, that dropped to the surface of the planet. And so, so how did that whole part of the, of the mission work? Well, it's, it's a lot like you say. They, they had landers, they dropped them, they had parachutes, they had retro rockets. Um, and it was kind of neat because they, they looked a bit like beetles or turtles with their legs tucked in. And as they descended and fired their, their retro rockets, their little legs came out and they landed securely on the surface, just like every science fiction movie ever trained us to imagine. Well, and this is a very familiar landing system. I mean, the, the one that was very different was, was what happened with Spirit and Opportunity when they had and Pathfinder. these... Pathfinder. And Pathfinder, right. When they had these airbag systems and they would, they would come down by parachute and then they would be slowed down and then they were just dropped and they would bounce along the surface. But, um, but the Viking one is very similar to what we saw with like the, the polar lander where you had this, like it actually gently touched down on the surface of the, of the planet. And, and it's a matter of difference in weight, which costs money, difference in um, 
Well, what's required in order for the mission to succeed? Pathfinder was basically the size of a Tonka toy you might give your two-year-old to play with. It was a robust little rover, and uh, dropping it and letting it bounce, it was fine with that. Um, the, the Viking experiments, however, they had to have a correct orientation. They had a lot of delicate experiments on board, and they just weren't ready to be dropped. And they also weighed more. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, while you don't fall faster when you weigh more, um, you do have a whole lot more energy that you impact the surface with when, when that one-half mv squared hits the surface of the planet. And, and with the parachutes and the retro rockets, they were able to dump that energy into friction, get rid of that energy by expending the retro rocket fuel, and it just led to a um, safer, safer landing for these heavy weight and uh, very delicate instruments. And both landed successfully. Both totally landed successfully. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the technology, um, again, I mean, we think about the kind of technology they had available to them at the time. This was 75 I when know. these things launched. We I were know. little kids. I know, and, and, the, and the, the, the list of failures, of failed <laughs> Mars missions that just yeah. goes on and on and on, that, that landing a spacecraft on the surface of Mars is an incredibly difficult process, and it is the place where your dreams go to die. Yeah. And, and yet, these two spacecraft landed safely and and did some science well, one more than the other but yeah <laughs> yeah well and and what was amazing is like viking 1 refused to die yeah it it was the little mission that kind of like spirit and opportunity just kept going and it's going digging and digging and, yeah, yeah so for 6 years and 116 days this this spacecraft sat on the surface digging looking up watching the weather um, just being a happy little robot, taking scientific readings. And I'm sure there were a lot of scientists that were frustrated that it didn't have more data that it could take because it only carried so many. Um, it, there were a lot of biology experiments on, on board, and they could only do so much. But um, yeah, it was just really kind of awesome. And and part of the reason that, that I'm saying Viking 1 uh, lived forever wasn't that Viking 2 wasn't as good as Viking 1, but they landed in different places. So, so Viking 1 landed much closer to the equator, and, and that meant it had a lot more direct sunlight. Direct sunlight means charge the batteries faster, you get a little bit of dust on your solar panels, you're fine. Um, but Viking 2, it was twice as far north. So with Viking 1, it was at 22.48 degrees north. Um, with, with Viking 2, it was up at 48.3 degrees north. So that's significantly further. That's, that's like you're in Canada if you want to be yep. on the planet Earth thinking about Canada it. Canada on Mars, which is extra cold. Right. And it's not just extra cold. I mean, cold matters. They do have to keep the electronics warm. But the, the sunlight's just coming in at that much steeper of an angle, and it's not, gonna illu it's not going to illuminate your solar cells as, efficient, as efficiently, and it's not going to charge your batteries as quickly, and the batteries just eventually died, and that caused the, the one Viking mission to just not quite last as long as the other one did. And so what was the main objective with these spacecraft? Again, it was very ambitious. It, this was the set of missions that were going to figure out if there was life on Mars. This was back in the days where NASA was still allowed to be looking for life. There, there was actually a, a political moment in the 70s um, where, where kind of the mandate came down that NASA was not going to expend its energies and resources looking for life. Um, but this was prior to that when looking for life was still cool. And yeah. uh, so there's a whole series of different experiments on board each of these exactly identical twin rovers. And, and these two pairs of, of experiments were going to sample in two different locations. Does the soil have carbon-based molecules in it? Does the soil have stuff in it that metabolizes? Does the, does the soil have stuff in it that, that exhales, does it, just all these little tiny experiments, and when I say little tiny, I mean literally little tiny, because they had to get carried all the way there. And um, 
unfortunately, we didn't fully understand the chemistry of Mars soil at the time, and, and it's only now with, with Phoenix Lander, and we'll hopefully learn even more with Mars Curiosity um, Science Laboratory. We, we just didn't fully understand the, the chemistry of the soils, and without understanding your starting point, it's, it's hard to design experiments that will get you to a specific end point. And this has led to controversy. Right, and this is the big controversy, right? But, but again, I mean, the whole concept was just so ambitious, yeah. right? Like, let's send a uh, let's send a spacecraft that's equipped with enough experiments inside of it, and then let's give bacterial life whatever it wants. If it's there, we should see some kind of output. Let's give it water. Let's give it warmth. Let's give it you know potential right. but food sources and all that kind of stuff and the right gases that they might they might require. And hopefully the bacteria will will do whatever it does in response. And and I guess, and what was the result? Back in the day, they performed the experiments, and what did they find? That they were confused. They were confused. Really? Is that what <laughs> well, they said? No, they didn't. Well, it, they didn't it's say, so, oh, you know, we're confused. No, they said, we've something's happening here. Well, so, so it, it's always been, as a community, we've been confused with specific individuals saying, we did or we mm -hmm. didn't. And, and then many of us in the middle going, we don't know. We, we don't, don't know. Yeah, so, so they, they had four different experiments on board. And the first one was a very simple, we don't necessarily know a, if we're going to inadvertently kill life with the nutrients we brought, so let's just look for organic molecules. So the gas chromat chromatograph experiment um, got a sample of the soil, heated the soil up, and, and through heating it, broke it into its different constituent pieces, and used a, a grass, gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer to measure what are all the different constituents of the soil. Now, the fact that they heated it up is, is the key clue for understanding these results. Um, because it turns out that there's certain chemis chemistries that when you heat them up, break down any orga organic molecules that might be present. When they ran this experiment back in the 1970s, the result of the experiment was there were fewer organics than like a scoop of sterile soil here on Earth. And that was sort of a no life on Mars result, but it turns out there was a chemical present in Mars soil, um, perchlorate. And this particular chemical, when heated and mixed with organics, breaks down all of the organics. So even if there had been organics in the soils, this particular experiment turned out to be precisely designed to destroy them. So right. that's a null the, result. Right. The, the perchlorate is, is not good to life, right? No, no. Well, it just breaks down. It's a dissolvent, essentially, for yeah. organic molecules. So. It, it's sort of like washing everything in acid is, is right. the best way to think of it. Sending, sending, yeah, right, dropping your soil in bleach and then seeing, you know, what you find. Right, yeah, yeah no, all the bacteria are dead, thank yeah. you very much. We can't find any alive bacteria in this, <laughs> in this bleach. What's going on? So, what's so, wrong with our experiment? Yeah. So the per perchlorates, when heated and mixed with the soils, would have quite happily destroyed any and all organic molecules. No life for you. So that, that counts as a null result, but we didn't understand it was a null result until Phoenix got there and Phoenix found the perchlorates that we didn't know were going to be in the soils. So at the time, it was a, um, there are no, no organics was the way to read that particular experiment, which was frustrating. Now, the second experiment was a gas exchange experiment, and, and this was another one that, that took a sample of the soil. Um, in this case, when they say heating, they, they say incubating. They're, they're trying to, to inspire life to, to do its normal thing. Um, and, and so they scooped up some dirt. They added um, a bunch of organic and inorganic nutrients, um, mixed it up and then they looked for respiration. They looked to see um, what are the concentrations of things like oxygen, CO2, nitrogen, hydrogen, methane, things that you would expect that the ratios of these different atoms in the 
atmosphere of the container would change as you have life forms respirating. And how they would change would depend on the life form. So they, they didn't go in with, with a, we expect to see mm -hmm. um, carbon dioxide exhaled, we expect to see methane exhaled. They went in saying, we're going to look at all the things we know life inhales and exhales and see how it changes. Right, and you could imagine, right, that the surface of Mars is such a toxic environment yeah. with the radiation blasting down and the cold temperatures and the lack of liquid water and perchlorates in the soil, which we now know, and all of these, all of these things which are counter to life, but you can also imagine that life, as they say, always finds a way that it can, it can last in these really extreme environments and maybe it just hibernates and waits for periods when maybe the soil is a little damper or maybe it gets, you know, the sand covers it up a little and, and it gets a chance briefly to do some more living. And so that was, I guess that was the goal, right, was that you would, you would just start to give it some of these ingredients that it might require and then just see if anything at all happens. Yeah, and, and we know that there's examples here on Earth where there, there's various bacteria, there's various parasites, there's various fun, fungi spores that when the conditions get too dry, they just basically ball up into these inert balls. Uh, that's a boring yeah. way of putting it. Yeah, but, it's but they hibernate. Happens. They wait. They wait for the. Yeah. They wait for whatever it is that they require to come back. And and all it takes is a very brief smattering of of millimeters of rain, and suddenly everything is able to complete its entire life cycle before the water dries up again. And they were kind of hoping that maybe there's that sort of life form that all it takes is that moment of being warmed with nutrients and life would spring back into existence, but no, no life for them again. Okay. Um, so, so we have one null result, we have one no result. Right, so, one, so the first result being we screwed up the experiment. Yes, the killed second one, anything. Right, second <laughs> one being we didn't, we didn't find what we were hoping, so that's a negative result, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so the next experiment was a labeled release experiment. And, and the idea here was we're going to feed anything that might be in the soil sample carbon-14, which is a radioactive form of, car of carbon, um, carbon-14-based nutrients. So they, they took a soil sample, they dropped in this solution of nutrients that were tagged with the, the carbon um, molecule, carbon atom, and then they looked to see if there would be respiration that would cause the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere of the chamber that this is going on to change. Uh, so the idea is that if you consume radioactive carbon, you're going to excrete radioactive carbon and exhale radioactive carbon, and, and what goes in has to come out. And so they looked for that over time. This poor little bacteria. Didn't anyone, you know, <laughs> they, they should have been a little more careful at this sort of never look free you know, nutrient <laughs> soup in the, you know, in the mouth. But, well, yeah. it, well, you're tagged with carbon-14 as well. This, is, this right. is how we figure out how it's, long things have been dead on Earth. It's just more, you know, it's more. Here's, you know, <laughs> let's just mix in a little carbon-14, a little radioactive carbon-14 in, uh, in your meal. Yeah, soup's it's on. It tastes good with your Wheaties, that's It's good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they loved it. It was delicious, spicy. Well, um, and, and the thing is, they seem to have loved it and thought it was delicious. And... And I can't speak for spicy, they're molecules. Yeah. Um, but this, this is the most intriguing of the experiments because they watched it and lo and behold, everything they anticipated happening happened. There was this gradual systematic buildup of carbon monoxide with carbon-14 atoms in the molecules within this chamber, completely consistent with metabolizing it. And they, they, they tried doing the same thing with, with comparison samples, and all of the results worked out consistent, but then everything else was, was a mess, and so this led to a lot of, well, maybe it's just a chemical reaction, and the chemical reaction when you drop this in caused things to happen, and the things that happened just happened to release this gas in a systematic way. Yeah, now you're saying all that in your skeptical voice, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your grumpy skeptical voice. Well, maybe they... But, but I think 
when the experiment turned showed up exactly what people were looking for, um, that's the beginning of this inquiry, right? That's the starting yeah. point. Again, you know, with the previous one, negative result, then yeah, let's all agree that nothing happened. But this one, positive result needs more science. Right, and and this is this is the one that has continued to be debated since this basically data was taken when when we were still in diapers, and and so that's an entire couple of academic lifetimes of research that have gone into this, and and when we do find life, it's not if we're going to find life, it's when we do find life. It's going to take extraordinary evidence for people to believe it unless it walks up to us and yeah. pokes us in the nice face. Nice to meet you. Have some uh, right. soup. <laughs> yes, when they start feeding us carbon-14, right, exactly. we'll believe it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Wait a minute. This has a <laughs> lot of carbon-14 in it. No, it doesn't, Earthling. Yeah, but right. So, so this is the one that's been debated back and forth for years and years and years, and... Um, but you said there were four experiments, or do you want to talk about? Well, it, so so the fourth experiment, um, it is it's another one of those, huh? Okay, so so this is this is another one where um, they they looked at what are the things that that go into life. So in general, you need light, you need water, and we we look at carbon being present because we're assuming that the life we're looking for is going to be like the life as we know it. So carbon based, not silicon based or something else in that particular column of the periodic table. And and so this is another one again where they're looking at the radioisotope of carbon 14 and in this case they're looking to see if there was photosynthesis present. So again, take everything um, and here they, they were mean. They, they gathered everything together and they baked it until all of the gases were removed. And then they collected everything and looked to see if the carbon-14 in the atmosphere of the container had been converted into a biomass. Um, so basically, once you bake all the gases out, has the carbon in the atmosphere been respirated into stuff? So think here on Earth of carbon fixation that happens in plants that convert atmospheric carbon into part of the tree. And so when they looked at this one, um, it, it was one of these things where it was actually a completely inconclusive result. They, they looked at, at it, they, they considered the chemistry that had happened, and it just didn't match anything. So this is the one that gets talked about last because chemistry as we anticipated didn't quite happen on Mars. Mm -hmm. So neither positive nor negative, simply a, oh, that didn't behave as we expected. So there were four experiments. First one, if there was life, we killed it by baking it. Second one, um, no evidence whatsoever. Third one, total evidence. Fourth one, oh, that didn't work as we expected. Right. So four experiments, two spacecraft, confusing results, a lot of people sitting back going, this isn't sufficient evidence to say there is life. This is sufficient evidence to want to go dig more. Right. And with the funding structure the way it's been, this has become justification to go look for water and with Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity, we're not necessarily going to be doing life-specific experiments, but we are going to be continuing to look for the chemistries required for life. Now, doesn't that decision strike you as kind of weird? That, that you know, finding life on Mars would be on the pathway to perhaps the most important discovery in all of scientific history, right? If you discover life on Mars, then you've then maybe that means there's more life in the rest of the universe, and maybe if it's completely unrelated life, then that's super interesting. Even if it is related to Earth life, that's still really interesting. You have a, you know, and so you get, and you get an inconclusive result, but a very interesting result. You know, I think any scientist's first experiment is run the experiment again. You know, let's fix all of the mistakes that we made, and let's run that experiment again. Let's get another, you know, we've already got a mission, we've already got a, a blueprint on how to build it. Let's just send another couple with some fixes to sort of 
you know, catch the mistakes or the misunderstandings we made the first time, and let's get to the bottom of this. But instead, NASA went in a completely opposite direction. They went, no, you know what? Too weird, too hard. Let's look for ancient water, and then created a completely different mission well, profile I, for I, ancient I, history of, you know, ancient water. So that's all. I mean, I find it, it's a very strange, you know, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, because that's not what it is. It's it's political, it's Congress. right? It's Congress. Yeah, it's a political thing. And, and yeah. And I honestly think with things like Mars Science Laboratory, it's at a certain degree a Hubble-like mission. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched with two key goals, to measure the expansion of the universe, Hubble constant, and to figure out what the heck planetary nebula are. And look at everything else it's been able to do. It's, yeah. it's a beautifully built, diverse mission that was funded and launched with a very focused science goal. And Mars Science Laboratory isn't quite that focused. It is a kitchen sink mission. It has a ton of different experiments on it. And its goal is to study the chemistry of, of Mars. Because you can't say it's going to study the biology of Mars. Because there's lots of people out there who think that looking for life is dumb and a waste of resources and a waste of money. But at a certain level, astronomy is physics, which is mathematics. Chemistry is quantum mechanics, which is physics, which is mathematics. Biology is chemistry, which is physics, which is mathematics. And, and so when we say we're launching my Mars Science Laboratory to study the chemistry of Mars, there's a lot of potential to do yes. a lot of off-label Usages? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And if you ask a, you ask a scientist working on that, like, are you guys looking for life? They're like, no. But, no. Yes. but you know, you know, <laughs> wink, no, we're not looking for life. <laughs> but that, that is such a sophisticated uh, rover with all kinds of amazing scientific instruments on it and the ability to go wherever they want with power to run for a very long time. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is, if not an absolute life finder, it's going to get us pretty close. Right. And so, so sorry, I mean, you know, where we stand now, because we mentioned sort of at the beginning of the show that, that this is sort of ripped from today's headlines, that if we'd recorded the show, uh, uh, you know, a week earlier, a month earlier, then we wouldn't have been able to include this stuff. So what's all the, the most recent stuff that's been, in, that's been coming up on this story? So, so that labeled release experiment, there have been... Communities with, within the, the astronomy and astrobiology and planetary science community who've been trying to say, no, 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 all of that observed uh, metabolism, that was clearly just a chemical reaction. And, and so they've been trying to model what sorts of chemical reactions can produce the, the carbon-14 release that was observed over time within these chambers. And they, they've gotten so that they, they can figure out how you'd get it released, but people who have recently done what's called a complexity analysis of the data, this is where you look to see um, if we look at all the fine variables, if we look to see over time, do the ways in which we observe in the laboratory these possible chemical reactions, do they actually match the systematic results we saw or not. What we find is the amount of randomness inherent in the carbon release within the laboratory experiments is a much greater amount of randomness than the systematic release that appears to, to replicate what we see with metabolism. So you can sort of imagine you, you um, take an inert bacterium, get it all happy and respirating, and it's just going to start breathing, and it's going to keep breathing, and it's going to do this in a systematic way. But if, if you've ever done the, the Alka-Seltzer in vinegar experiment or Mentos and Coca-Cola experiment, you know, you drop it in, massive reaction that then tapers off over time, and it varies every time depending on, on how things get dropped in, that little bacteria, it's just going to breathe. And so what was observed matches the respirating bacteria, 
much more than it matches the random chaos inherent in a chemical reaction that's allowed to just do its happy chemical reaction thing. But does it not necessarily match a starving bacteria that hasn't seen food for 74 million years and is just trying to gobble up as much as it can before the... No, the it does match the bacteria is the thing. It right, doesn't right. match... It doesn't match the chaos of, of a chemical reaction. Right. So complexity analysis is now pointing to this, according to one community within the planetary science, astrobiology, astronomy community, yeah. according to this one group of researchers, this was evidence for life that we've simply been in denial over for the course of, of most of my life and yours. But, it, but again, you know, you get to the bottom of it and you have two groups essentially saying slam dunk, it's life. Yeah. But it doesn't matter, right? Like, here we are, slam dunk, it's life or is it until the next research paper comes out. And the reality is just because we don't have this ability to go and just check the soil again yeah. in a comprehensive way, we can't get any further than this. We're stuck at, we're pretty sure it's probably life based on this 35-year-old research, this data that was gathered yeah. is sitting in a computer tape somewhere, that that's all they got. And, and that, that it's, it's the need for the ongoing discovery and exploration to send and those kinds of experiments back to the surface of Mars and keep looking. And, and I really hope that they don't send human beings to Mars until they figure this out. Because uh, imagine the person who, without thinking, wipes their nose on their hand, grabs their spacesuit, gets bacteria from the nose on the outside of their spacesuit, climbs into their spacesuit, and then gets snot bacteria all over the surface of Mars. Um, we, we don't want to go to Mars as plague carriers. And yeah, and I know that in, in recent, some people have been proposing just recently much tougher, more stringent measures on, on, on avoiding this biological contamination. Right. And, and while we'd like to think that most of the, the viruses and bacteria and prions and everything else on Earth um, would happily die, or unhappily die, as the case may yeah, be, on yeah, Mars. That's what I was thinking, like, ah, oh, where, where am I now? This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> what is this but, place? <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, we have extremophiles on our planet yeah. that could probably make it quite easily once they got a foot or so beneath the surface of the planet. Yeah. And, and so we really do need to be careful not to, to be plague carriers on other planets. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that wraps up this uh, this episode of the uh, of the of Astronomy Cast with the Viking Landers. So, thank you very much, Pamela. It's great to be back and and recording again. And thanks to everybody who had some patience. We will be back up to speed shortly, and uh, and we'll see you all next week. It's great talking to you. Save. Okay, everyone, we're going to ignore you for a few minutes while we save and quick garage band. And uh, then we'll work on taking your questions. Okay. All right. I have saved. Let me just see your if we have any questions. Your computer is faster than my computer. It's not. Let me see if we have anything. Now, now I have to look on YouTube because now there's questions on YouTube. And actually, when we did the, the live astronomy uh, last night, we got a ton of questions over there. Really? So, yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. We need to get yeah. better at that. So, I don't know. Maybe there's a way. Well, you know what? I don't see it. Okay. My channel. I think it's on my channel. One second, and I'll give and now you... And ah, now I'm seeing myself. <laughs> right. Mute, mute, mute. Yeah, I am. I, well, I, I pause myself. <laughs> um, and, and if all of you listening could plus one and share this, we'd deeply, deeply appreciate it. Yeah, so just the, in the new world, now that uh, Google Plus has taken this to the next level, so when we record any of our shows, uh, it shows up in, in my stream on Google Plus, and then I guess Pamela shares it on Google Plus. It also, we also embed it into our, uh, our channel on CosmoQuest. So if you go yeah. to CosmoQuest, dot org slash hangouts you can see the show there furthermore um, it's now posted live on YouTube in on my channel the universe today channel on uh, on YouTube so um, and a lot of people always ask us like you know where can we find this stuff happening and so it's part of the problem is that it sort of shows up everywhere all at the same time so we're, we're still and, and if, this out. if you want to keep track week to week of what we're doing 
go to uh, CosmoQuest, register for account, and within your profile, there, there's two checkboxes. One is to sign up for the newsletter, and the other is to sign up with, for the alerts, which we haven't started sending yet. Yeah. Um, but we did send our first newsletter out yesterday, and this is your way of getting in your inbox all of a week's given events. And yeah, and so the goal is... We'll see how far we want to take this, but the goal will be eventually that maybe we can send out a notification. If you want to know that we're about to record Astronomy Cast, you'll get an email from us saying we're going to record Astronomy Cast in the next 10 minutes or whatever. Right. I think is sort of one of the ideas. Because Probably that's an a, hour one. An hour, maybe. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if it can send out fast enough. Yeah. But the point being that, that a lot of people never know when all the stuff is happening, and, and there's so many time zones and so many changes in schedule and so much variety. So I think if we can provide, email is something that everybody has, they can always yeah. use. Uh, but the other best way to find out about it is to is to follow our Twitter feeds. So uh, yours is Star Strider. With, with a, a y. y. Yeah. And mine is Universe Today with a U. Um, <laughs> and then, and we'll try and post there when we're about to record. And so if you, if you want to get that. And you could have created like an if, then, this, then, that notification. Yeah. Send you an email. I have yet to figure out how to use that officially. Oh really? I love yeah. that. I love that software. It's you really will cool. need to give me yeah. a tutorial at some point. Yeah, it's awesome. Um okay. Uh now let me see if I can find the the actual hangout. So I, I love the random comment. Someone, uh, Vignesh uh, Vishwana, I'm so sorry, I know I mispronounced that. Uh, he wrote, is there a diet carbon-14? I, I love the concept. Diet no, it's 14. just carbon-14. Nope. nope. <laughs> now with half the radiation. Uh, well, after I think it's, that's called carbon-12. Carbon-12, yeah, after it's already <laughs> degraded a bit. That, there's your diet version. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, now, now Jason uh, Major, one of the writers over on Universe Today, linked in the comments an article that was just done fairly recently on this exact topic. So yeah. uh, it would be very interesting if you want to read more into it. I highly recommend Universe Today. Uh, I've got complete coverage. Um, uh, so <laughs> Katrina Ince asks, uh, how careful were they to clean the vehicle before it left Earth and not contaminate Mars? So this is one of these big problems, right, is, is back in the day, did they spend any effort? Yes, they did. They actually what thought ahead the, of that. What about the old, like, you know, the previous ones that landed on Mars by crashing into it? I can't speak for the Russians, yeah. but, but America has consistently taken effort to try and keep our spacecraft clean. But at a certain level, we did assume that things would get fried off the outsides of the spacecraft during takeoff and, and reentry. Um, so there, there's always been some, some concern that maybe there was something on the outside of the spacecraft that, that just didn't get taken care of um, as it should have through the transit to get there. But, One but now we've discovered this sort of terrifying lifespan of water bears. Yeah, that was you what know? I was going to bring up. These, these yeah. are awesomely cute little bacteria yeah. that look like gummy bears. Yeah. Um, and and there, there's now a, a plushy microbe version of them that I need to purchase. Yeah, I think we've um, got one. <laughs> But uh, th these things have gone up on the, the heat shields of spacecraft and quite happily came down and drop them in water and they quite happily live. These are things that won't die. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the life is a lot tougher than, uh, than anyone ex suspected. And this is what yeah. I was mentioning in the episode itself, that, that now the, sort of the new constraints on how powerful and how survivable life is is starting to really define uh, the, their decontamination procedures for future spacecraft, but a lot of the damage is kind of already done. You know, yeah. there are You know, so your worst case apocalypse scenario has already happened, which is that if spacecraft, which haven't been too carefully decontaminated, have landed on the surface of Mars and invaded. Yeah, I, there there is the legitimate concern that we have launched to Mars some sort of microbe or bacterium that here on Earth is slow to multiply, easily controlled, it got there and it quite happily got into the briny water system and destroyed life. Yeah. Think of like starlings here in North America. Or, or the, the more realistic um, comparison is there's a fungi that is carried by African 
African clawed frogs, which are in the pet trade. And the African clawed frogs are quite happy to live with this, this fungi. They have na naturally born chemicals to deal with it. And um, because people are dumb, some of these frogs have escaped and been led into the ecosystems of South America, where they are causing mass extinctions of all manner of amphibians, frogs, salamanders, the whole nine yards, because the, the South American critters just don't have the, the mu immunity to it. Uh, so I've got a question here from YouTube, which I've finally been able to find. Uh, Traniker says, could the spacecraft be contaminated during takeoff in the atmosphere? So you could go and put all of your effort into decontaminating it here on Earth, and then it makes it up into space, and it go, passing through the atmosphere, you know, a bunch more bacteria in the atmosphere gloms onto it, and boom, you've got the same problem. How could you... Well, so, so the idea here is is the Delta rockets and, and the Atlases and all of the and space shuttle when we were using the space shuttle, um, they, they all encase the spacecraft wi within nice happy shells and then it's once it gets to orbit that that opens up. That's where failures tend to happen with Soviet craft or Russian crafts lately. Um, but they open up, release the spacecraft and, and so as long as they, they are safely enshrouded during the takeoff part, they, they don't actually get exposed to the atmosphere at all. Yeah, okay. Um, let's go back to the... Uh, oh, Jason Major, again, one of the writers on Universe Today, mentioned that uh, the Viking technology spun off to become the Easy Bake Oven. <laughs> yes, it sometimes seems like that. <laughs> I think the Easy Bake Oven, though, uses way more electricity than, than uh, the Viking probes had available to them. It has an entire light bulb. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's not that much different. I mean, they, they had to use solar power. I mean, there's only so much it, it's a resistor. baking they could yeah. do. Yeah, baking they could do. When you describe baking, you're not thinking of like some kind of professional oven. You're thinking no. of a very it's, hot wire. Yes, that's all it is, is a very hot wire. Right. Um, uh, so Nick Howes wants to know, uh, so did we, did we factor in decontamination with Apollo? Was there, you know, was there a any care taken to make sure that we didn't infect the, the moon? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Simply because the moon, we've always said, is dead. And, and um, yeah, I, I know the astronauts complained about getting moon dust inside the Apollo capsule. So the fact that they got moon dust in means bacteria could probably get out. So, so I think that that simple complaint means, no, we didn't take it into account. Oh, um, Detlef is mentioning in the comments that the, uh, the landers didn't have solar panels. Were they um, radio? Oh, panels? were they radio isotope? Yeah, they were radio uh, isotope. Oops, sorry about that. Sorry. We so can. yeah, so so again, it's not about the the latitude isn't going to matter for the amount of energy that they're getting, but just the horrible temperature extremes going day to night yeah. would really wear and tear a spacecraft. I mean, the, one of the biggest problems they were really worried about with Spirit and Opportunity was just the batteries that you're you're every night you're cooling your batteries down to you know dozens or even yeah. 100 degrees below zero, and then you're, during the day you could come back up to, uh, some, in some cases, 10 degrees above zero. Yeah. And it's that, that cycling of the batteries that's really, really hard. And so what Spirit and Opportunity had to do was they had to run heaters that would keep their batteries warm through the, this long uh, or these, these really cold Martian nights. And it's the same situation. You know, the, the more extreme the cold temperatures exchanges are, the harder you have to run your power just to keep your batteries from, from dying. So. Yeah, so it was, it was radiothermal and the orbiters had solar arrays. I goofed profoundly. Yeah. Thanks. That's why we do this. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll have, that's it. We'll re-record. <laughs> but, um, uh, okay, cool. Um, anything else? I don't see any more questions. If anyone has any more questions about either uh, what we talked about or uh, space and astronomy in general or what we're doing with CosmoQuest, uh, now would be the time. Uh, and if anyone has any recommendations for shows they want to see. I want to do a show on the Venera mission. I okay. Cool. Which we, I don't think we've done them yet. I don't think we've done any of the... We, we've done... 
a bunch of Luna missions early yeah. on. Yeah, but we haven't done, I mean, we've talked about, about Venus a bit, but we haven't talked about just what amazing s engineering went into actually land spacecraft on the surface of Venus and transmit pictures. Yeah. So uh, those are really cool. Um, I will so, so Toby Samples is asking, um, have any tests to see how Earth bacteria deal with Mars-like environments been done? Yes, and, and some bacteria can cope and some can't. And what I think is particularly neat is people who are trying to figure out how to get um, more advanced life forms like grasses, for instance, to be able to survive in, in the low pressure environments to potentially set up a ecosystem based on converting the, the carbon rich atmosphere into to oxygen or carbon dioxide rich atmosphere into an oxygen atmosphere. Yeah, and this is part of that problem where, I mean, they always say like in every square meter of soil there are thousands of undiscovered kinds of bacteria. Yeah. And so, you know, if you want to discover new forms of life, all you have to do is just dig in your backyard and you will find bacteria with new capabilities and characteristics that that no one has ever seen before right and and so we just have no idea and and once you have no idea but almost infinite potential then things get interesting and that's where uh, you know you never know what's going to happen if you take all the soil and and or the stuff in the atmosphere or the stuff that's on your fingers or who knows and you put it over to Mars most of it will die a horrible death some of but. it survive or at least go into hibernation yeah. and others might actually be able to thrive in that environment. Yeah, it's, it's, I, there's so many different invasive species that we deal with just on the planet Earth and admittedly climate doesn't vary that much here but um, yeah, there's, there's lots of things yeah. to worry about. And so Nick Howes is, men, is, is noting that Mars 1 and 3 probably seeded life. Yeah. If if this is a real issue, because you know in the 1960s and 70s, the Russians probably didn't have the clean room tech that we have now. So that's a good, really yeah. good point. And those landed on the surface of Mars. And for uh, for broad definitions of landed. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yeah. So I think that 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 is kind of out, already out of the bag. You know, that cat is already out. That was it. That horse is already out of the stable. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and Nick Howes is, is also asking, um, do we need a champion like Sagan was with Viking to make a major mission, e.g. a human mission, really happen, or will politics always be a factor with that decision? Th this is a very complicated question, and one of the things that many people have been noting is um, no one's really stepped in to, to fill Carl Sagan's shoes. We, we don't have that academic, f I'm, I'm trying, I'm young, um, we, we don't have that academic full professor out there who's both a researcher and a advocate of science who, who's been able to make that transition. Brian Greene, sort of, but he's, he's string theory, string theory, string theory. Mm -hmm. and Neil deGrasse Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson's not an academic. He's, he's a trained PhD scientist he runs a planetarium and he's not still actively doing research. Right. And, and so you see there are all of these people who've left research to pursue full-time communicating science. And there's just not that many people who are insane enough to try and maintain research while also maintaining communications. And, and I'm trying and, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping to succeed. And Nicole Gugucci, who's, who's behind age-wise, um, I'm hoping that she'll also be able to do it and that by working together we'll, we'll both be able to pull it off. Um, but you need that still doing research person to get the respect of the academic community and you need that avid communicator who's willing to communicate to the people in the media of their choice, which includes social media mm -hmm. um, today. And, and it's a complicated balancing act and it's sort of like good people don't go into politics anymore because we don't want the background check. Well, nowadays, good people aren't trying to do both because the complexities of succeeding in academics in the extraordinarily limited funding environment we're in are just much harder than what Carl Sagan's period was dealing with Steve. in the post-Sputnik era. Yeah, Steve Squires from Cornell. He's, he's an excellent example. Mm -hmm. He's a pretty good example. Who's, yeah. And then you've got Seth Shostak, right? He's, a pretty, he's not so much an academic anymore. Yeah. But but it's a great 
publicizer. So, and is still you know doing research through the SETI Institute. So I think there's there's room for new ways that this can work. Yeah. And I think that's one of the really exciting things about the internet as well is that is that we're starting to break down a lot of these walls and these sort of assumptions on what great communicators are gonna are gonna look like. And I think. And there are it. lots of great scientists out there doing great communications. Alex Filipenko is out yeah. there. Um, it, it's just a matter of, of that, that person who's both pulling off hosting a television show, writing the books on one hand, and then doing the research, sitting on the committees, writing the white papers. That's two entire lives being lived simultaneously. And we don't have secretaries anymore. Yeah, Carl Sagan was a very special guy. Yeah, I mean, he he was able to uh, do the science and think at a level scientifically and and think about the ways to the experiments and the research that he wanted to do, but also did a, just a fantastic job of communicating. And I think those are pretty big shoes to to fill for for anybody. And so and I it re think, it yeah. requires a level of of. Uh, personal organization that I think has been been the thing that holds a lot of us back. Um, it, there's just certain people whose lives you look at. Chandra Sekar is another example. He wasn't a public communicator of science, but he was someone who ran a journal, established a, a research institute, did amazing publications, and taught. And, and you read the biographies of these people, and what enabled them to do that was consistently excellent spouse and the ability to say, I'm working, go away. And the ability to say, I'd like to go play in the sun, but I'm not allowed to because I need to be writing 3,000 words today. Yeah. And, and you have to have that delayed gratification as a primary mode of operating in order to pull it off. Well, and I think that, that you know, advocating for a human mission, I, I really feel that the chances of one of the major space agencies actually putting together a human mission and being able to see it through the four terms of Congress or whatever that it would require to, for it to be able to be pulled off is, is pretty low at this point. Yeah. And that I think, but there's some really interesting things that are going on. I mean, we keep talking about how the the sort of commercial private space industry is starting to really get up steam. And there's this announcement that's coming out shortly that someone is going to be attempting to find an asteroid and bring it back to Earth. That, and and this is a you know, realistic endeavor yeah. that it, the biggest problem with building big things in space is getting the material up. And it could be so much easier to just go grab yourself an iron yeah. chondroid or an, an iron um, yeah. asteroid. And so, yeah, so I think that, that it's not about having any one advocate. It's not about someone captaining the big ship and pushing in the right direction. It's about this thousand flowers blooming. It's about us having access to space and being able to, uh, for people to be able to work on this technology and, and actually make some progress. I mean, the problem right now is there's just no, there's no way that the regular people can get anything done. But now there's Kickstarter, right? People can put yeah. together, could put together missions now with Kickstarter and get the funds raised for them. And I think I'm not sure how you get 1.6 billion dollars through Kickstarter. Well, but you might no, no. no but I mean, you could get a hundred thousand dollars through Kickstarter to do a a modest telescope, like the most, like yeah. Canada's most telescope, right? I mean, there's that these things are, are achievable. There's a lot of people that, that say like, oh, you know, I never, I really, I'm so mad that we haven't gone back to the moon or that we haven't gone to Mars or, or what have you. But now there are actual methods in place, the Kickstarter and things like that, where you can put your money where your mouth is. You can write yeah. a check for $10,000. You can put into the hands of a, an, an experienced team of, of space engineers and give them a crack at actually putting something useful into space. So yeah. I think we're, I think things are going to look out, and things are going to turn out not like we were expecting, but they're going to be very interesting. And, and we're at a really interesting time in sort of this whole process. And I'm as, I'm as excited now about the future of space exploration as I've been at any time in the past. More excited. I'm, it is the most exciting time in space exploration since the Apollo days, I think, right well, now. What, what I'm really loving is, is throughout the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s, everyone turned to NASA and said, NASA, what's our future? And Congress turned to NASA and said, no budget for you. Um, I've been watching too much Seinfeld, apparently. And, and so NASA's ability to fulfill dreams has, has 
really suffered. And then it was com made even more complex by the fact that, that NASA became the organization that you went to if you wanted an organization to be off budget and off timeline. And when as an organization you, you demonstrate over and over and over that you can't complete projects on budget, Congress is going to stop giving you money until you prove you can finish something on budget. So, so there's this horrible feedback mechanism where right now NASA and Congress are staring at each other and Congress is going, prove you can behave, and NASA's going, okay, but we're going to have a limited dream. Fine. Let them go off and do their happy little reproving themselves. But while all of that was happening, all of these people started the dot-com movement, all of these people were successful online, and now they're sitting there saying, okay, I've made these amazing things online, where's my jet car future? Dang it, it's not here, yeah. I'm going to fund it. And so you have the, these folks starting organizations like Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and, and X-Core and Blue Origins yeah. who, who are coming at it from having made their, their money and now they're like, there's a problem, I'm just going to spend the money needed to solve the problem. Yeah. And, and so it's no more waiting for NASA to figure out how to accomplish something within the rules of the government. Anyone who works for the state or federal government knows there's nothing that kills a good idea faster than paperwork. Yeah. And, and all of these entrepreneurs are innovating space. And, and it's, it's an amazing time to live in because you just had to get the right rich people annoyed and they're going to solve it for us. Exactly. And this is this whole problem, right? As soon as you wait for some, uh, someone else to do something for you, as soon as you wait for NASA to, to get this, then you stop trying to do it on your own. Yeah. And, and so then when, when, when finally you discover that they're not going to do it, that, that it's not going to happen in the way that you're expecting and that the dream is going to be delayed, you stop you stop putting all of your hopes and dreams onto some other agency and actually just get it done on your own. And I yeah. think that, that this is the stage that we're at now, which is people are realizing that there's other ways to get this done. And and I think this is where they might be surprised. Like, why did we wait so long? Why didn't we just get yeah. started earlier and pool our resources and try and get some of these stuff out the door? And there's a lot of people that have been doing that. I mean, you look at what the Mars Society has been doing and the, the Planetary Society. I mean, there's a lot of, yeah. of great work that's being done to try and help move this process forward. And now they're in the perfect position to, to really help uh, sort of organize all of these movements to take things to the next level. So like I said, I'm as excited as, as possible for the future of, of space exploration. Everything is fine. And, and the X Prize is just mm -hmm. going to push the innovation forward. It, yeah. I, I was talking with the Google Lunar X Prize people last Wednesday. You can go watch it. It was our science hour. It's posted in the AstroVids feed. And, and I asked them the question, when is someone going to get the Lunar X Prize? This is a prize for getting a robot to, to the moon, having the robot get by whatever means possible. I suggested dancing, uh, go 500 meters, and then send a video back to Earth. And they think it's going to happen in the next five to ten years. And I, I just have visions of a happy little Sony robot just kind of booging its way across the moon. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right, well, I think we're running out of time, so why don't we wrap this up? So much for being quick, um, <laughs> but uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this. So thanks again, Pamela, and uh, we will, what's next? Uh, we've got the Science Hour on Wednesday. Science Hour Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. If you got our newsletter, there was a link to all the time zones of the globe. Yeah, if you didn't get our newsletter... Calendar. You yep. need to sign up for our newsletter by getting an account at CosmoQuest. So once again, a reminder, go to CosmoQuest.org, sign up for an account. At the very least, it will keep you appraised of everything we're doing, but at the very most, you will get a chance to participate in real science and help identify craters and uh, discover how many We're discovering there are. Kuiper Belt objects. We Kuiper have a project objects. called Ice Investigators yeah. to discover Kuiper Belt objects. Yeah, and and there's, there's so much exciting data that, that we're just waiting for permission from NASA headquarters to release. Wait, wait. We, I thought we didn't ask for permission anymore. Uh, and the data is not in oh, the public. Okay. All right. It's All right. not publicly available data. We, we right. need permission. Right. The point <laughs> being that if you are concerned about how much science is getting done, how much exploration is getting done, get active, get involved, participate, fund some Kickstarters that relate to this. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, help promote people who are doing some interesting things. Join CosmoQuest, help discover craters, uh, get your telescope out and join our virtual star parties. Uh, we don't need to ask for anyone's permission. We are 
we're moving forward. So and, and we're taking and making that dream of the International Year of Astronomy reality. The universe really is yours to discover, and you can do it at CosmoQuest. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Pamela. Thanks to everybody who watched, and we will see you. Uh, when There's probably going to be more episodes this week because we need to get a little bit caught up, so but don't be surprised. But they will have no warning. They will have no warning, yes. Don't be surprised if another episode pops up in a, with no warning. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and we will talk to you later, Pamela. Bye-bye.